as many of you know who spent the evening reading their bylaws, the purpose of Viva, among other things besides facilitating fair elections in Virginia, is to promote communications among the local boards and between the local boards and the state board of elections, and to establish and maintain appropriate liaison with elected officials, including members of the General Assembly. That is in our bylaws, it is part of our purpose in Article 1. And we are extremely fortunate this morning to have um, senior members of the General Assembly um, who serve on the important committees. Um, and I think, importantly for us, we have representation from both parties and from both chambers. And I'm going to um, give a brief introduction to both members, and then I will ask uh, W. Landis to speak for five minutes or so, and then Senator Edwards, um, and then open it up to questions, um, which they are delighted to uh, answer for you. There are um, many, many um, accomplishments and achievements that lead to a position um, like Steve Landis being a member of the House of Delegates. And I'm introducing him first because he is a member of the House of Delegates. And the House of Delegates, as many of you know, is the descendant of the House of Burgesses. So it is the senior chamber in our General Assembly. The Senate did not exist until 1776. Um, and the House of Burgesses itself dates to 1619 and takes its form, as Speaker of the House John Warren Cook once told me, from the Burgesses in the city of Bristol, which was the major shipping port for England going out to the west, the rest of the New World. Um, so there's an awful lot of history that goes into the chamber, and the people who run for it and are elected um, take an awful lot of flack criticism and every uh, election criticisms from their competitors, and they yet have the willingness to serve the public. And I think Steve is one of the people who um, I might just mention has demonstrated through his own uh, service in other areas as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Center for Rural Virginia, um, the Frontier Culture Museum of Virginia, the Augusta County Historical Society, the Shenandoah Valley Technological Council. And one of the things that I personally find most fitting uh, for a member of the General Assembly, he's a former member of the Board of Visitors of the Virginia School for Deaf and Blind. What better training could you have to work with people in the General Assembly? <laughs> But he has a great deal of other talents which have commended him to the voters in this district. Um, and now I just mentioned um, John Edwards. No, I might, I should, sorry, sorry. Um, I have omitted um, the fact that he graduated from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, a very distinguished school. And I must say that um, I'm intrigued by that. He was not one of my students when I was teaching there. He managed to get out before I got in there. <laughs> but I'm sure he did very well. Um, now, Senator Edwards, being from the junior chamber, um, um, does have a noble pedigree in the past, which they tried to cover up because the Senate represents the governor's council, which was appointed by the king. And they were all monarchists and hierarchs, and they were trying to live that down ever since, is that right? <laughs> And John and I were classmates at the University of Virginia. Um, he was in law school. I was a struggling Dabney scholar. Uh, for those of you who went to the University of Virginia, there were the Eccles scholars uh, who had actually achieved something. The Dabney scholars were those who had signed the Dabney door. We didn't achieve anything. Um, but John uh, had a most extraordinary um, beginning in his career. Um, when I say he went to 
in, in Brooklyn Big School in Virginia. He went to Princeton, which is a, a sort of sidestep. Most of the people who remember um, that the founder of the College of New Jersey, as it was in those times, came from Goodson County and decided that the people up north needed to be educated. And uh, we're very happy that John was able to go up there and, and benefit from Princeton's education. And then he showed the most remarkable talent, I think, responding to an inner call. He went to Union Theological Seminary, um, which is something that I wish more members of the General Assembly would do. <laughs> uh, but he fell among thieves, and I should, I should not say, Senator John S. Edwards. You know, in the Valley, we often don't explain the names. Uh, S is for Saul, but he was on the road to Damascus. <laughs> and he fell among thieves, and went out of theological school and went to law school, <laughs> where he's been doing good ministry work for a long time, I can tell you. He became vice um, mayor um, he, uh, at the uh, Roanoke uh, City Council, um, and before he became a senator. And you all may remember that he was uh, he runner up in the uh, Democratic primary for Attorney General in 2001. You know, coming second is pretty good. He said, you know, President Ken Huckabee said that, you know, it's not as good as coming first, but it's you know, good come second. Um, so I would like to turn it over to first to Delegate Landis um, to give us a brief description of what it is like to herd cats and push rope when you're working with the sausage factory. And then we'll ask Senator Andrews. Robin, first of all, thank you for that introduction, um, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it, I guess it's fitting that we're meeting in this room because I, I am looking at the uh, capital of Williamsburg behind you all. Um, and as Robin said, uh, those of us in the House are very proud of the fact that we are the body that has continued since um, 1619. Uh, some of us hope to be uh, still in the General Assembly when we celebrate the 400th anniversary of the founding of the House of Burgesses in the General Assembly in 1619. Hopefully John and I will still be there, but that will be up to um, the folks that we represent. Um, I also want to thank each of you uh, for the work that you do in making sure Virginia's elections are administered fairly and by uh, the state code. And I think a lot of our constituents don't always realize that your, your job um, makes our job possible. Uh, those of us that are in elective office uh, are only there because our election process, unlike if you look at other countries or even other states, um, we don't have problems. We may have lines sometimes, I know in Northern Virginia and other places um, related to the presidential elections. But if you look at our election process and you compare that to other countries, uh, ours is secure, ours happens every year, as you all know in Virginia, sometimes two or three times a year, depending on the primaries or um, the May elections for local uh, elected office. But uh, it works very well, and you should be proud of that. Uh, and I thank you for the work that you do related to that. I also just want to thank you for inviting my wife and I to be with you this weekend because uh, the homestead is always one of our favorite places. Hopefully, uh, you all have enjoyed the weekend. I know uh, Delegate Ben Klein, who represents this area, appreciate you all being here, uh, helping with the economy uh, for Bath County. And uh, what I thought I would do, and John and I talked about this a little bit uh, yesterday, I think we're going to try to give you some uh, ideas on what we think uh, you can do to be uh, effective in working with the General Assembly, and uh, hopefully, Robin, not all of us are deaf or blind or both, but um, sometimes I know it seems that way when you talk to members of the General Assembly. Um, but I'm going to try to give you some pointers from my perspective. I'm fairly new to uh, the Privileges and Elections Committee. I've been on since about 19, um, 19, 2008 uh, or 2009, I think is when the Speaker first appointed me. And when he appointed me, um, I asked him, I said, well, why, um, why are you putting me on that committee? Because I've been in the General Assembly for 18 years now. And he said, well, um, 
One, we need somebody, we need to continue to have folks from the rural areas, which I tend to represent a fairly rural area, represent part of Augusta, part of Rockingham, part of Albemarle. And he also said, uh, he said, see, the thing I always appreciate about you is you just have, you don't mind asking questions. Uh, and that is the, the way I've tried to approach my service in the General Assembly. We always can agree to disagree, whether you're from the Democrat or Republican Party about various issues. But the one thing I think we can agree on is it's our job to ask questions and make sure we understand why we need to change a policy or why we need to put something in place, whether it's legislation or the budget or whatever that may be. Uh, some of our colleagues, and I think John would agree, don't always ask questions. Um, and I've always thought that even if it's a, um, somebody may say a dumb question, we can all learn from uh, that experience, but more importantly, um, find out more because of the answers people that um, provide. A lot of people also forget when we don't ask questions, uh, not everybody understands every issue. The General Assembly is a body of generalists. None of us are experts on anything other than, um, you know, for instance, John's an attorney, so obviously he knows um, about the law and, and has had a very um, very detailed experience in many aspects of the law. I've worked in business, so I understand you know, business-related issues. And we gain experience um, on various issues, but uh, we're not experts on, on, on many things because we deal with 3,000 pieces of legislation, and that uh, has to make um, us be more general in nature as, as being specific. So let me talk to you a little bit about how I think you all can be more effective in getting your issues adopted by the General Assembly. And I, and I don't think it should be a, a, a tough sell. I think you're already doing this to a certain extent. But these are the things that I've found uh, have been important over the years. One of the things that um, you all are doing, and I know Robin and, and those, of, um, those of you that come to Richmond or um, you know, the members of the state board that are there or gone, uh, it, it's important to not just assume that your work is during the General Assembly session. I've always told groups that it's much more effective if you really work with the people that you want to try to influence from the standpoint of your issue related to elections and election law uh, in the interim. And your old group has been doing that and the general registrars have been doing that. That is meeting with your local legislators about the issues of importance to you and do that this summer um, and early fall. Don't wait till December, uh, don't wait till January. Um, and there's a good reason for that. One, you'll have a um, good quality time to spend with us, an hour or more, in the General Assembly session, um, or ramping up to the General Assembly session. Most of us have 15 or 20 minutes to sit down and talk in detail about an issue. That's not enough time when you've got a complicated issue or you've got a series of issues you want to address or talk to a member of the General Assembly. So spend that time before the session. Um, you're all general registrars in your association are working very well together, and I want to commend you on that, and I want to uh, encourage you to continue that partnership, um, because that's very important. From your all standpoint, you've got policy or legislative issues, and you've got budget issues, and you can't approach those in the same way. Uh, one, uh, the budget-related issues are a little bit more complicated, the process is a little bit more complicated, uh, and it's a little tougher to understand for the, for the lay person, um, even for those of us in the General Assembly that have been involved in it. It's sometimes um, a difficult process. So I think you need to have folks in your um, association and the general registrars that focus on you know, the policy issues and some that focus on the budget issues and, and try to specialize, if you, if you will. And I think if you'll do that, that'll help um, make you more effective related to that. I think you also need to target those of us that are on the Privileges and Elections Committees in both the House and Senate. First and foremost, that's not to say you can't talk to the other legislators, but those are, those are the folks that are going to vote on your issue to start with. If it doesn't get out of committee, it doesn't get to the floor, it doesn't move over to the other house and vice versa. For your budget-related issues, I think you really need to work on um, your relationships with members of the Appropriations Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. And uh, the chairman of those committees is very important to have and build a relationship with. 
and the staff directors of those money committees because they're the ones that are making the decisions once the governor's budget has been introduced and then the General Assembly gets its you know, shot at it, so to speak. So I hope you'll um, work uh, in the next year and really try to look at, and many of you probably know members of all those committees. They may be in your area. And I would start you know, really working with them now because the biennial budget will be coming up and of course we have a brand new session and uh, it is an election year so they're going to be willing to meet with you especially the members of the house of delegates um, any, any elected officials always happy to talk to folks when it's an election year so um, take advantage of that fact the other thing you can do uh, is to try to if, if there's going to be new members of the house um, it's, it's good to get to know those folks, but you probably want to wait until after the election because of your position um, in the uh, electoral process. Um, and that's just something for you to consider. But it wouldn't hurt to get to know the candidates that are running just a little bit, get them to know that you all are in charge of and making sure that the elections are run fair and administered fairly. So um, I think that is always a good thing to do. In addition to meeting uh, during the year, I think there's some things that you can um, take note of. Once you've met with the legislators, find out what they liked about your proposal or what they didn't like. It's always helpful, and always um, for those of you that maybe have been in sales, you, know, you can't sell anything unless you find out what the, object, um, the objections are, because that's, that's where you're going to make or close the deal, so to speak is getting the person to realize this is something that they actually need or they need to do. But a lot of times people have objections and they'll throw out objections, why they don't like this or that. Well, find out what those are and see if you can make adjustments to your policies that you would like to see enacted or your budget-related um, items and see if you can make those adjustments to try to address some of those concerns or to try to minimize those before you go forward for the General Assembly session. That will also help you all know when you hear from other legislators what are the concerns you're going to hear and to have an answer for them, saying we're addressing this, we're going to amend legislation this way, and uh, that will help uh, serve you well. After you've had the meetings with your legislators, follow up with an email or a letter. Um, I don't know about John, but we get tons of emails, and it's sometimes hard to get those. A letter really stands out nowadays because nobody writes them to us anymore. Uh, so if you really want to get their attention, that probably is a good way to do it. Um, a phone call after you've had your meeting is also, I think, helpful. Um, just talking to the uh, legislator uh, or their staff person. When you've had the meeting, when you've addressed the objections, when you've um, um, done all those things, don't forget to ask for the commitment. One of the things that is amazing to me, having been involved in this, is I have many, many groups that um, call and ask me if we'll meet, and they say, we'd like to have your support. And a lot of times, I'm not going to do that initially, because I want to do more um, homework on it. I want to maybe talk to some other folks uh, in the legislature and see what they've heard, what they're hearing from their constituents. Is it a concern that they so I won't make a commitment up front. Sometimes legislators will. Sometimes we'll say, sure. For instance, uh, this year the General Registrar's and the Electoral Board folks um, met with me uh, in the summer this past year. And they um, set out a couple things. And I said, well, I, I think I'd be interested in trying to do that. So I was committed to doing a piece of legislation for them. And, and that came out of that meeting. Unfortunately, it's one of those that didn't, wasn't successful. But, um, but, you know, at least we tried. But, um, I think don't forget to get the commitment or ask for the commitment. And don't just ask once. If they don't say yes the first time or they won't give me an answer, when you do that follow-up, ask them then. Um, if they still don't give you an answer, just follow up you know, with a phone call uh, or another follow-up meeting. It doesn't have to be that long, um, 15 or 20 minutes, and try to get that commitment. And if they won't commit, but they want to wait and see what the legislation's like, they want to wait and see you know, the introduction of the session, just follow up during the session as that um, process goes along and try to, try to get that commitment. The other thing I will tell you that, you know, most groups um, believe that um, those of us that are going to actually vote are the, uh, obviously, most important folks to be in touch with. 
with, whether we're on committee or um, you know, the, the members of the House or Senate. And I think that's true. But I think there are other folks that you need to build relationships with. And that's what we're talking about. This whole process that I've mentioned is building a relationship. Uh, I've been in business for a long time, and I can tell you the best um, business relationships are, that I have had uh, and have are ones that, one, took a while to build, and two, that you keep um, you keep promoting, you really try to uh, work with them, um, and you keep that relationship going. It's not just a one and done kind of thing. So the same is true for the folks that support us. Uh, each of us have legislative assistants that do a lot of work. They're going to be the ones that may be the initial contact you have. Get to know them. Um, go by and talk to them if you can. Uh, really work with them as well because they are our eyes and ears and more importantly they can be a good friend to you all if you build that relationship with them. There's two reasons. One, they'll be a good contact with the legislator they work with. Two, they can help you track the legislation. They can help you work uh, the system so to speak once we get to Richmond and that process starts because um, it's hard sometimes to keep track of all the uh, moving parts. Also get to know if you can the legislative staff that works the committees. We have uh, um, the clerks that work the committees. We have staff attorneys that work for the Division of Legislative Services. They are great resources, and get to know them um, if you can, especially those of you that are in the Richmond area uh, during the session. And just um, try to understand uh, you know, where they're coming from on things. And realize they're the ones that draft the legislation or in the case of the Appropriations Committee staff that deal with your section of the budget, they're the one that draft the budget amendments. They're the ones that are doing the analysis, if you will, of the legislation or the budget-related items. And, and get to know those folks um, if you can and uh, build that relationship. And then the last thing I'll say, and turn it over to John, it's not just the General Assembly that's going to be important in this process. Um, I'm, I'm trying to tell you what I think you can do for the General Assembly. But you've got to do the exact same thing with the governor and his administration, um, the uh, state board of elections, and you do that. Uh, that kind of that um, that support is very helpful. If you can get the governor or the state board to support and back some of the issues that you all have, uh, that's a great um, great thing. And there are two other groups, and sometimes I know that's you know there are differences of opinion um, from administration to administration. But if you can get them to buy into it, or at least not oppose something. Uh, that goes a long way. And then there's two other groups. You all work with them year round um, because you work with the local elected officials. But FACO and VML need to be more active in supporting your issues. And the reason I say that is I have local governments all the time saying, you know, we really need more support for this and we need more support for that. Um, and they don't want any more um, unfunded mandates, and I understand that. But um, I haven't always seen VACO and VML really be supportive of your all's issues. And I think that's a problem. Because when we hear from them, we want them to, we, we um, understand that you're an integral part of local government. And um, obviously we have a state function and a federal function, uh, but, but basically you're, you're a local, um, local government entity, so to speak, um, and how and where you operate. And I think VML and VACO really need to have more connection with your leadership uh, and understanding your issues because it helps them as well. Um, if they're supportive of you and you're supportive of them, uh, that can be very beneficial. I think it's a partnership that probably has been untapped at this point. It also diminishes some of the problems we have when the local governments are saying one thing and you're saying something else. And, um, you know, again, Legislators don't like to get involved um, in conflict between uh, local entities, if at all possible. Whether it's the school boards and the, and the local governing body, or whether it's the electoral board and the local governing body, uh, we like to minimize those as much as possible. So if you work together, and again, that's not going to always be possible. Your, your priorities sometimes may be somewhat different than theirs. But there are things, from a funding standpoint, I think especially, uh, that you could work together on and that would be very beneficial. And with that, I'm going to sit down. I know I'm taking more than five minutes, but I'm a politician, so what do you say? <laughs> I didn't know I was uh, on my way to the mess.
this room. It's time to go to law school, but um, I want to thank you all for inviting me. Kathy and me to be here this weekend. This has really been a lot of fun. We really appreciate uh, the invitation and the opportunity to get to know some of your name and some of the others that I really didn't know before. Um, and thank you, Robin uh, Lynn, for your very warm introduction. Um, he's just as entertaining before the Privileges and Elections Committee as he is here. Uh, and just an erudite and just as uh, enjoyable. Uh, so and, and we always enjoy uh, welcoming Robin before the p and &E Committee when we're dealing with bills. He's always very insightful as well. Um, the, uh, and I'm delighted to be here with my good friend Steve Landis. Um, yes, he is of the most the elder body, <laughs> the former House of Burgesses. People forget that, that um, you know, the Senate didn't happen in 1619. <laughs> it was, wasn't until after the uh, War for America's Independence that it got started uh, after the Declaration of Independence, when the, as, as I understand it, when the Senate was uh, first formed. Steve and I served previously on the Code Commission. He was chair for a number of years, and after he left, then I became you know, currently chair. And uh, people refer to the Code Commission as a powerful Code Commission. I'm still trying to find out where that power is. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's one of those commissions that you can imagine. If you're a lawyer, you like to kind of you know, picket things and, and, and rewrite, to find one word as opposed to three words to say something and figure out where the semicolon should be in the Code of Virginia. You probably love being on the Code Commission. Uh, former Chairman uh, now Justice uh, Bill Mims used to refer to the Code Commission as the semicolon police. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, some of the work we do. Uh, in Virginia, I think, has uh, gone a long way uh, in our history in terms of improving voting. Uh, as you know, at the beginning of time when uh, the Constitution was established, only white men who owned property, real estate, could vote, period. And since then, we've expanded that a little bit over the years. Um, but our history is kind of up, up and down. We have a checkered history. Some we're proud of it, and some we're not particularly proud of it. But since the Supreme Court's decision in uh, the voting, the one person, one vote, a series of decisions starting in about 1963, I believe, uh, voting has become more fair, more just so that each person has the right to vote. And since the 1965 Voting Rights Act in particular has opened up voting to minorities, and, and since the Supreme Court got rid of what we used to have here in Virginia, you know, the uh, poll tax and the um, literacy test and all these other things, hopefully uh, voting is open to everyone, and, and we've made an awful lot of progress. Uh, going back over a number of years. We've gone a little bit away, I guess, from what I call the cemetery voting, where uh, the stories were that the night before the election, somebody was out there checking all the names on the, and the um, plaques and the monuments in the cemeteries and writing them all down to make sure they got the names correct. <laughs> and the theory that the dearly departed deserve the right to vote just like everybody else. <laughs> There's a story I heard of a Southern historian talked about one of the southern states, South Carolina, Georgia, I don't know which one of them, I'm sure it was not Virginia, where uh, back in the olden days, uh, you know, the Democratic Party totally dominated the South, the Southern Democrats, in the latter part of the 19th and first half of the 20th century. And um, the, I think he was referring to the election of 1928, when Herbert Hoover, the Republican, ran against Al Smith, the governor of New York, who was a Democratic candidate for president. And they were talking about in one county after the election, did you know 10% of the people voted for the Republican candidate? And a guy said, I cannot believe 10% in our county would vote Republican. But what astounds me the most is those vote for a county. <laughs> now, I, you don't know whether to laugh or cry, but <laughs> I don't know if those stories are real, but hopefully they're apocryphal, but I know some of that kind of stuff really did go on. Um, I, with regard to uh, what do you do uh, when you come down to Richmond and how do you get bills passed? Uh, I agree with everything Steve said. I hope you wrote it down and <laughs> follow it uh, to the T. But uh, I've always uh, reminded of what somebody once said, nothing ever happens in politics just because it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you may have the most brilliant idea in the world, and unless there's somebody behind pushing it, it's probably not gonna happen. So the most important people in some ways whether it's good or bad, you decide. 
is how the bill is put through and the lobbyists behind the bill. Who's pushing the bill and why? What's the ultimate ulterior motive here? So keep that in mind. I would strongly suggest that um, it's like the early bird gets the worm. You know, get there early and get there often. Uh, start, if you've got an idea about a bill, first of all, get the people behind you who think it's a good idea. The electoral board, uh, uh, the um, registrars, the and, and as Steve said, get the local government behind you if you can. As many people as possible, get behind the bill and, and sit down and figure out what you want. And use legislative services, they're great, as Steve said, uh, uh, or local attorneys or whoever. Um, that you can to put together something that you really want to do that you think makes sense and do your do your homework. Maybe research the, 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 the bill or the idea and to come up with really the best way to do it. And get to see your delegate and your senators early on. August is not too soon. Because in August and September and October and November, we're not in Richmond. Once you we're in Richmond, if, if you've been down there, you see what we do Monday through Friday, is bang, 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 bang. The two, what, 2,300 or something like that bills uh, that we consider each year, got a thousand of them passed, I believe, something like that, and then the Senate House and 500 from the Senate, something like that. It's an enormous number of bills. In a very short period of time, it's not possible to become, get up to speed on every single bill, even every bill in your committee. And so keep that in mind. Get there early, sit down when you have time to talk to the, your legislator, Ask for an hour, half hour at least, uh, to sit down and, and in a relaxed fashion and get to know the legislator, but also then go through why this idea is a good idea, why it's needed. A really good reason why you need the bill. And then find out, as Steve also mentioned, what are the problems with this? What's the other side? Who's going to object to this and why? And uh, work out the problems as early on as you can. Um, I like to, what I like to do when people come see me, the first thing is, what do you want to do? Be specific, don't beat around the bush, and don't be generalized. Be, what is the problem we're trying to fix? Be specific with an example, if you can. And then, uh, so I, I want to know, why do you want the bill? And then if you have it in writing, I'd like to take a look. Being a lawyer, of course, I want to take a look at it anyway. But then I want to know, who's on the other side? Who's opposed to the bill? Now, you may not know at that point. It may not become obvious to you go before the committee to find out the opposition, and it may surprise you. Um, and then, uh, so I want to know what it does, what's the problem that needs to be fixed, who's on the other side, and who's on your side? Who's pushing the bill? Who cares about it? Is there anybody that cares enough about the bill to come to Richmond? Anybody cares enough to write a letter? Uh, the ML and Baco in particular, they're your local governments. Uh, they should be involved in these things. Half the time, usually they're not. But it would be helpful if you could go talk to them and get somebody from the <coughs> Beco to be on your side and push it. So forget co-sponsors or co-supporters or co-lobbyists, people who will work with you. Like I say, um, what happened, the way things get happen in Richmond so often is uh, the, the, the energy behind the bill has an awful lot to do with whether or not it's even going to be seriously considered. When people come to see me, and I tell lobbyists this all the time, put it all in one page. Everything that's worth saying in one page. And try to come up with uh, what I might refer to as a sound for your bill. You know, voter voter. Um, the uh, early voter. Uh, no, 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 no excuse uh, absentee voting. Something that's simple and easy to understand, a sound bite. You know, that's how uh, politics seem to work these days. If you get it on the form of a soundbite, people might actually understand it. But if you've got to say 25 words or more, then I guarantee you they won't understand it. Uh, so try to make it simple, easy to understand, if you can possibly do it. And then say, one page. Now, people say, well, I can't possibly put all this on one page. I say, well, it, put, put it, add attachments if you need to. That's fine. You can have 50 page attachments if you want, if anybody wants to read it. But uh, everything that's worth saying has got to go on that one page. If you can't put it on one page, go back and get somebody who can't put it on one page. Uh, simple sound bites, and with it, as many attachments or references as you want. I think it's also helpful to make sure your bill doesn't require a budget. 
<laughs> if you need money to do it, you got a problem. This is Virginia, after all. We don't like to raise taxes and we don't like to spend money. And uh, so it found a way around the issue of money. Uh, I know a lot of your issues are money. Uh, last fall, the long lines, a lot of it had to do with money. Uh, a lot of it has to do with getting the, uh, the kind of um, the machines, uh, the uh, optical scanners that uh, most of you maybe don't have that cost what? Money. We all understand that, but if there's a way around that, uh, keep that in mind. And as Steve said too, the, there's a policy issue and there's a budget issue, often they go together. But if you can, in going for the PME committee, if you can avoid talking about how much is this really going to cost and how much is it really going to cost the localities, because the localities are probably going to say, don't look to us, <laughs> look to the state. The state's going to say, don't look to us, look to localities. And so you're going to have that kind of problem. So if you can anticipate that and figure out how to do away with it. Um, the bill is always going to go before a committee, and sometimes a subcommittee, before it goes, obviously, to the full body. And if it doesn't get out of the committee, then it's dead, and you might as well go home and do something else. And it's got to go through the committees in both houses. Therefore, you, it's a good idea to get a lobbyist in both the House and the Senate, companion bills. If it gets through one body, then it, it doesn't get through the other, then there's a second shot at getting through the next body. So keep that in mind. Get a lobby, get a, a, a sponsor, ideally, who's on the committee. It doesn't have to be, of course. But if you can get a lobbyist on the committee, at least you got one vote. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then sometimes bipartisan. You have a delegate in the House and a senator uh, who's a Republican, and a senator who's a de uh, Democrat in, in, in the Senate. It doesn't have to be that way, of course. But uh, keep in mind that you got to get it through the committee first. And once you get your sponsor, then go to the members of the committee. In the Senate, there are 15, in the House, 22, I guess. Um, that's, that's not as many people as 100 delegates and, and 40 senators. So start first where it counts, which is in the committees. And, and make sure you can line up your majority in these committees, because like I say, if it doesn't get out of the committee, it, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, the thing about the letters, I agree. Letters, are, if somebody actually writes a letter, types it up, or, or handwrites it so you can read it, it's really more effective than just a mass of emails. We get tons of emails. Sometimes you don't know where they come from. But if you get a letter from somebody you actually know, or you know of, we all read those things. I guarantee you we read them, and I always respond to them as well. Uh, this year, we, we had uh, the issues concerning you know, the primary petitions and the Republican presidential primary last year when Newt Gingrich and some people didn't get on, their, on the ballot for the Republican primary because of the uh, complexity of Virginia, the number of, uh, of uh, names you have to have on the petitions. We had a bill that passed with regard to that. I think it passed that, yeah. Uh, long lines, of course, uh, three or four hours, people waiting, which is very unusual, uh, but that's because 73, 72 percent of people voted uh, in Virginia. I think some what, 87 that I hear last night? 87 percent? 44.4. Yeah, 44. I was thinking, which communist country is this? Is this two or one? That doesn't happen except in Soviet Union and <laughs> places like that. But that is remarkable. And it speaks well of our democracy that we have that kind of uh, interest uh, that people would come out to vote. Keep in mind, presidential years are always different. Gubernatorial years, 40, 50, 45 percent, 50 percent maybe. Uh, legislative years without the governor, anybody running statewide, what, 40 percent or less, something like that. So, and then of course local elections, you know, it's what, 25 percent, maybe good. So, you just have to staff up or down as the case may be for, for the respective elections. Anyway, I'd be glad to answer and ask people to any questions. Hope you have some good questions. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. We do have microphones, and I see some of the usual suspects already approaching them. Uh, please come to either the rear or the fore, and uh, tell us your name and your locality, and then to whom you would like to address your question. Go. No. <laughs> the, um, 
the chair wants to um, take precedence and have the first question. <laughs> My, my question is for either or both of you. Um, we as electoral board members are responsible for uh, supervising the, the work and, and uh, evaluating the work of our general registrar. We as electoral board members are, are part-time employees. Uh, our general registrars are, except for, except for 17 statewide, they are, they are full-time. But this is, this is their bread and butter, it's their, it's their daily work. They are very committed to their work. We could not do what we do without them. Um, yet their duties and responsibilities have not been reviewed in the past, I think, <coughs> over 20 years. It is now general right registered. 20, 23, it's been 23 years since the registrar's duties and responsibilities haven't been reviewed. Um, is there is there anything that, that you could comment about that, or you know, I, I know that, that they've been asking for it, and, and we, on their behalf, would like to see something done. I'll, I'll ask first the chairman of the powerful Code Commission to answer this. Are you the former chairman? Okay. 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 Um, Ray, that's a that's a good question. I think. One of the things that in talking to the registrars last year, I asked, and I don't know if it's something you all would consider, and, and when was the last time, you all know the last time we actually had the Joint Legislative Optimal Review Commission look at the election? 1991. So it's been, yes, sir. so it's, it's probably time that we really have a um, top to bottom review of the general registrars, kind of the population, uh, your all's function, and you know, when we say JARC, a lot of times people get concerned because you know they'll, they're looking for something. But but JARC, the vast majority of the studies they do is just to try to see how the policies have changed, how the funding has changed, um, both local and state uh, related to that. With JARC, the problem we always have, and I'm not a member of JARC, but um, I chair the um, the study subcommittee in the House rules, and we are the ones that uh, on the House side. Kind of you know, delve through all those studies and, and uh, JLARC requests and the like. The biggest problem with JLARC is just finding um, the right time to be able to do it from their workload standpoint. Uh, unfortunately, we keep asking them to do more, and they can only do so much. I mean, they've got a certain number of staff, but I'd be glad to work with you all to see if we could uh, do a resolution for a JLARC study. Uh, we'll see what John thinks about that, but I think that would be reasonable and, and um, you know, a good thing to do. If it hasn't been done since 1991, uh, I expect that it's uh, beyond time. Sir, it was uh, in uh, 11, but it, it, it never made it out. I think it was number, it was 68, I think, uh, but it never made it through the process. But it was attempted in 11. JLARC is Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission. There is a commission, House and Senate members oversee it, they're on the commission. It has a dynamite staff, very dedicated, very professional, that routinely study different um, uh, programs of the Commonwealth, make recommendations. Most of the time we just rubber tank them pass through without any objection to the recommendation because they're always good, they're very professional. JLR is a perfect body to study something like this. Uh, and if you want to get it through, lobby, lobby, lobby. <laughs> and explain why it's necessary. Talk to the people, the chairman of the various respective committees, rules committee, I guess, would, would, would uh, be the one to talk to. Senator Ryan McDougall in the Senate is chair of the Rules Committee. Talk to him, and the chairs of the various standing committees are all on the Rules Committee, uh, plus a few others. So I would go talk to each and every one of those people and, and say why it's necessary. And it, it shouldn't be, it's of course going to cost some money, but JLR has some money. It's a question of going to study this or study something else. One of the reasons Virginia is a, one of the best, maybe, I think the best managed state in the country, and has historically been so is because of JLR, Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission. You don't hear much about it, but the work they do is extraordinarily important. It keeps us running efficiently. If there's a, if there's overlap, they'll say let's abolish this commission, 
or maybe merge uh, uh, say government uh, agencies um, or make recommendations to improve an agency's uh, functioning or maybe abolish it entirely. I mean they're very good at weeding out the waste, fraud, and abuse that people like to talk about. But I would definitely recommend uh, that you do that and just start your lobbying now. You got two people who've already heard your, your story. <laughs> Senator, now questions for the membership. Thank you. Uh, I'm Philip Wolf on the uh, on the electoral board in North County, and I appreciate the delegate and the senator uh, giving us some useful advice uh, to actually influence and help steer the process. Uh, I wanted to point out that I uh, train 150 to 200 officers to run our elections every cycle. Most of them come back time after time. Sometimes there are new people come in and help us run the elections. Um, both the registrars and the electoral board have regions with 18, 19 localities in each one. We have regional meetings, bring those folks together to discuss issues. Um, it just occurs to me I want to return the favor for efficient campaign if you're speaking at a uh, county fair or racetrack or store opening, you don't know if you've got an 87% turnout crowd or a 40% turnout crowd. But when you're talking to the electoral community, every one of these people is a vote, guaranteed, time after time after time. So for efficient campaigns, you can't be talking to the electoral community. <laughs> <laughs> was that the p and &E members had never heard of a problem. So why do the part-time people need to be full-time? And I would never say this there because I think as a public official we shouldn't say things in public to undermine confidence. But I wanted to say it here. Um, there are things that every registrar in this room has done and many electoral board members have done just to make ends meet as far as making the election happen. And we pride ourselves on that stuff not ending up in the newspaper. Now, I'm not saying we're crooked. I'm saying that we stay up until 11 o'clock at night. We stay up uh, with staff uh, until 1 in the morning. We come in on the weekends. And um, these part-time registrars really need more support. They need to be full-time. And you're never going to hear these stories in the newspaper because we don't want them in the newspaper. It's our job to not be in the headlines. I don't want to be in the newspaper for good things. I don't want to be in the newspaper for bad things. I want to be unknown when I shop and go out in public. <laughs> I'm not a politician, um, as this lady pointed out. Um, I just wanted to say that here because I would never tell you that in Richmond. So when that bill comes up, I hope that you consider that and that you pass that on to your colleagues because there are things that we will never tell you in a committee meeting but that you need to know goes on just so that we can make the election happen. We make a lot of magic happen in this group. And I just wanted to point that out to you here. Thank you, Walter. You want to know what Let me give you um, um, something you can use as an example for that specific uh, request. And, and, and as you all know, you've all been requesting that for a number of years and to, and to fill those um, part-time but full-time folks and the benefits that come with it. I think one of the things that's been effective, I'm going to give you an example of another group. Um, you know, we uh, dealt with um, pay increases this year for a lot of different state employees and, and uh, teachers and law enforcement personnel and, and the like. One of the things I thought was most effective, and they did do this publicly, but they did this in lobbying individual members of the legislature, and that was the Sheriff's Association this year. Now, John, I don't know if you've heard this, but 
I did not know until this year that we actually have sheriff's deputies that are actually on food stamps yeah. because in some localities the pay is so low compared to other um, areas of the state. And I think most of us were um, shocked um, that we would have the people that are protecting us uh, each day uh, having to get food stamps. So I think if you can use that story that you just gave about what you all are doing after hours, what your registrars are doing, even though they're part-time, and give those personal stories to your local legislators uh, and to the folks that obviously are going to be making the decision related to funding. Uh, and I think, as I mentioned, that especially the folks in appropriations and the Senate finance, I think that will go a long way. But you got to have those specific examples because, yeah, I understand you don't want to say that publicly, and maybe some of those stories may get out if a legislator gives those as an example. But as long as, um, as long as you're, I think, uh, careful in how you approach it, I think that can be effective in lobbying. Because, you know, a lot of times people forget that um, uh, legislators actually are human beings too. Uh, and they understand the struggles that everyday people have. Uh, we see that every day. But sometimes we don't see it specifically with your issue or what your uh, general registrar is or what you may be facing. And that's why that relationship and really telling that story, as John said, started in July or August, and really sit down with them and say, this is why this is a problem. And, and the other thing I think you can do is, um, you know, you, for instance, I've got full-time registrars in, in all the localities I represent. So it's not gonna be the same, you know, tactic for me. What, what um, folks need to do in coming to me is, you know, give those examples of other specific localities that I may know. For instance, I think Bath County has a part-time well, that's, that's close to my area, and, and I can understand, um, you know, the challenges that they're having related to that. So I think that's the other thing you need to do is kind of tailor uh, that message uh, for those of us that may not even have, you know, part-time uh, registrars. And I think if you do that, I think that will be an effective way to really get your message across. This is a really good example of of uh, the fact that sometimes the best lobbying is not in the papers, is face to face talking to a legislator, explaining a particular problem. And the average person, I mean, can you imagine campaigning on, I'm going to make the registrar a full time registrar? <laughs> People would say, huh? <laughs> I should vote for you for that. <laughs> I don't even understand the problem. But if you can go to a legislator and then, like I say, uh, there's there's newspaper lobbying, but the best is behind the scenes going to talk to somebody about the real problem. Here's the problem. Here's specifically we have a part-time one, which he has this much to do, or he, I don't know who the person is. Um, and they don't, they need, they need help. And they need to spend, they need to be paid more in order to do it full-time because this is what needs to be done. If we're now in the 21st century and so forth. Line up your, line your ducks up. Uh, line up your evidence, your facts, marshal your facts, go see the local legislators involved, and then together go see the people on the p &E committee. If there's money, Steve's on the appropriation committee in the House, go talk to Steve, I'm sure he can do it. <laughs> but um, again, this is a good example of all of you together come making it as a, as a platform and say we support the following. And, uh, these part-time uh, registrars ought to be full-time. It's a good example. Phyllis. Phyllis Boots, Vitek County. Um, when you brought up the issue with the sheriffs, I wanted to share with everyone in this room because some electoral board members may not be aware. Part of the issue with the fact that our salaries are not reviewed, um, if you compare our jobs serving citizens of our locality to our constitutional offices, the deputies in many of those offices make more than the registrar. And we have full responsibility. So that's another fact check that's good to look at. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Diana. <laughs> uh, Diana Dutton, Prince William County. Thank y'all for being here. Um, I have a, just a couple of specific issues. One is um, absentee voting. 
this year in the election subcommittee in the House, and but also in the Senate, uh, the, the issue of uh, 65 years and older voters could vote absentee, and that would be their reason for voting absentee. We, our lines were horrible, uh, as you read the paper in Prince William. One of the things that might have helped had uh, we had the, the opportunity for these senior citizens, and I say that lightly, because that's not that old. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, we, they wouldn't have had to vote uh, outside, as outside polls voters. We would not have had to go to the vehicles to, to handle these individuals. So that issue made it out of the election subcommittee the first time in the House. Then when it got to the full committee, it got stalled. Senate bill came over, Senate passed it, came over, didn't make it out of the subcommittee. Um, that's one issue. The other is, I would, I'm sorry that you weren't here yesterday morning to hear the discussion on the vote centers. This is an issue that um, came before both of your um, bodies, different, legend, different sponsors, and <coughs> this is something we're interested in as a pilot project. It's a pilot project. It's not mandating everybody to do it, and we just want to try, and there are a couple ways it can be done, but it's just a pilot, and we'd like to try it. So, starting with speed, um, if you could tell us your thoughts on those just, two issues. Don't tell them. He said, ask for the order. <laughs> <laughs> well, Diana, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, <laughs> and um, with, um, you know, it, it's interesting with the, the 65 um, and older or for absentee uh, applications, I didn't think there was going to be that much um, concern. The, the problem, I will tell you, in the Privileges and Elections Committee, and I've served on there now since, like I said, it's not been that long, but things will come out of our subcommittees with fairly good votes, and it gets before the full committee. And the problem is, the assumption is, if it got out of subcommittee, there won't be any problems in full committee. And I think what has happened, and this goes back to what John and I were saying, is you've really got, we've really got to work full committee um, while that process is going, even if they're not on the subcommittee. I'm not on the election subcommittee, so I didn't hear or have the benefit of the, the discussion. I think part of the problem, of the, um, uh, and I'll be honest with you, that, that was not an issue that was brought up in my meeting with um, the registrars and the folks uh, last summer, and I probably should have been, because I should have been more um, up to speed on the reasons and, and, um, and maybe what other states have seen and, and the examples. As you all know, uh, again, when people start asking questions and there aren't answers, that doesn't give a comfort level uh, to folks. And I think with that specific bill, that's what happened. There were questions and there weren't answers or answers that uh, I think most of the rest of the committee members felt like um, they could understand, and that's what happened with that. Well, you know, part of that problem is the, um, it's the protocol. We can't speak in front of the full committee. Yeah, the chairman is very specific yes. about that. And, and that's part of the problem. And, and I know I wrote, and others did write, with numbers to you all. And but. I think which, with one of the things you are going to have to do is really sit down with Mark um, and talk to him about uh, just the fact that we only meet once a week. As you all know, that now the Senate Finance, or Senate uh, PD, I'm not sure about their schedule. We only meet once a week. It's always on Friday. Which I'll be honest with you, that's the worst day for me to meet because everybody's head is, is getting ready to get home. Um, and usually um, the session is going to be early because people want to get home. Uh, that's just human nature. And so we, tr we tend to rush through things when we really um, need to have more time on some of those things. The other thing I, I think you could talk to, you all could talk to Mark about is with some of these priority bills that you all have is talk to him and say, Mark, at least if it gets out of committee and there's discussion in the full committee, you know that these are the priority bills we've got. At least let us have the discussion with the full committee um, and not cut us off. Um, or at least have them so that we've got enough time that day on that Friday. So I think, I think he'd be willing to talk to you all about that. And, and Charlie and you know, anybody else that works with him, Don, 
I think if you all have that discussion with him now, to say we're not we're not saying you know redo your whole system of, of having everything burden subcommittee, but on those priority bills that our association has and the board of um, state board has uh, or the secretary has, you know, let us have that discussion. I think he might be willing to do that. I think that would help a little bit. And then the second one, Diana, is um, as you know, I carried one of the vote center bills. And that was the bill I mentioned earlier that the uh, Red Stars and the Electoral Board folks had come and talked to me about. Uh, I think that makes sense. I think the problem is, to be honest with you, um, we were able to kind of you know, get it through the committee. Um, Rich Anderson did a good job, but again, he didn't have a lot of answers to the questions on the floor. To be honest with you, um, he didn't ask me or anybody else to really help him with that on the floor. And I just assumed he was going to be fine, so that was a bad assumption <laughs> um, because it didn't even get um, voted through on second reading, which John, well, it was, it, it, did, it did move um, forward on second reading on a voice vote, which is very unusual <laughs> in the House. Usually at least um, have uh, legislation. And again, I think with um, more education, I think more members will be more supportive of that because it is just a pilot. All we're saying is allow the localities that want to try this once uh, before 2016, I think, is the date we had. Um, allow them to do that. So uh, I think I think that one uh, will have some support. I don't know on the Senate side where uh, vote centers went, uh, but again, that's. Uh, Creedence carried. Creedence carried, carried one of the bills. Did, it didn't come over to the House, though. I don't remember yeah, seeing that. Um, I think it was repeated. Was that okay. Okay. Well, I gotta, so it sounds like we got a little more work to do on both yeah, sides. Yeah. Yeah. But before we have the next question, Senator Edwards, if you would. Yeah. Uh, this is an example of, I think, two things. One, lobby, lobby, lobby. Make sure people understand and go talk to them. I know it's time consuming. It's y'all, a lot of people here. <laughs> Not since you're all in Richmond, I understand that too. But go talk to them privately, put something in writing, uh, make sure everybody on the committee, maybe if you want, if there's concern about passing the full body, email everybody in the home and the full body and then give them that one page thing as to why it's a good idea. The second kind of lesson here, if you don't, if something doesn't pass one year, there's always the next year. Often bills, it takes two or three years to kind of build up steam. I've seen bills that just got slaughtered the first year. Second year picked up steam and passed the third year. There's a half-life though, I think, after about four years or so, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Drop it and then come back a few years later if you want to, but there's just sort of a half-life of these bills that it often takes more than one year. Next question. Carolyn Coriel, Senate Bill 1, Fairfax County Secretary. I listened very carefully to both of you this morning but many times the issues that we would like to present to you all happen during the time we see our problems during election time, November. And sometimes it's not easy for us to try to get together and try to let you know what our problems are. And many times we think they're urgent, that they need attention with the uh, p and &E committee. Now, in my area, my delegate says, I'll talk to you after the election, and you know, let's talk about it then. Um, and many times, a couple of times, yes, they're passed, but also there are times when it hasn't. And especially when we're not just addressing one problem, we're addressing several. As you all know, we're a big county. Uh, we have, we're kind of the guinea pigs. We're the ones that find the problems faster than most of the state. But the thing is that, uh, I, I think it's a great idea for August, but many times the issues don't come to us until after the election. Could you comment on that? Well, yeah, I think we're aware of that, uh, but there's November, December, and I know you're busy, and too, everybody's busy. But um, maybe, you know, in your locality, you sit down with the board of elections and find a list of problems, talk to the general register about how you solve the problems, and then talk to people in Richmond. And then, uh, at a minimum, do a letter. Now, keep in mind that um, each legislator has a, a maximum number of bills that can be introduced. If the bills are not uh, requested from legislative services to be drafted by the first week in December, it is. 
It's like 30 days before the session starts. So if the bill is not requested for drafting before, say, December the 7th or whatever it is, uh, then that each legislator has, a, I think, how many now? Six in the House, and we have eight or ten in the Senate, I can't remember. And without unanimous consent, which is often freely given, but um, we're under the gun, too. I mean, there's a time constraint. That's just the way it is. But if you can sit down after the election, list the problems and how to solve the problem, and immediately go see the legislature, say, by the 1st of December, that means that you can at least get the, the request in, and then you're okay in terms of the number of bills that each legislator can introduce without requesting an consent. I don't know if that helps you or not, but. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Thank you. Carolyn, I think this goes back to, and this is something that maybe your um, executive committee or officers can consider. I, I would, from yours association and the General Registrar's Association, I would look at it as a two-pronged uh, approach. I think you look at your prior legislation that you already know, that you've had for a couple of years that you've not been successful with. You, you work on those in the summer um, and really try to educate members you know, over the summer. That's actually a better probably downtime for you all to a certain extent too. I mean, obviously by um, August though, September, you all start preparing for the election. And there's a lot I know that most of us know that you're, you're doing. So, you know, if you do that in July and August and, and you all have got consensus, and again, if you can get that buy-in from VACO and VML on those issues, or at least some support, you know, that's the time to do that. And so I think if you have that priority list, then if you have some um, things that come up, for instance, I know Augusta County had an issue um, that the, um, the association was supportive of uh, that happened because of the election where you know, they didn't have enough electoral board members to actually make a decision because one was sick Another was out of the country, so there's one left. Um, they had to have, um, and the judge didn't believe he had the authority to appoint somebody temporarily. Well, we took care of that. So there are things like that that come up. Then if you've got <laughs> issues like that, rather than have all the localities you know, going, um, and you can still do that, but if you've got then a second list of priorities that the association supports and that you are going to help work together, I think that would benefit you all um, tremendously. And I think that you can have kind of that second tier of things we learned from the last election that we need to fix. Um, the important thing, as John has said a, a couple times, and I have too, is that um, get those, those, those ones you can do out of the way and people educated about those. You obviously want to come back to them during the session. But those last minute things, you've got to get consensus. You've got to, you've got to again, prioritize. You can't have everything. Um, heck, as legislators, you know, we have lots of bills, and we'll be lucky if we get 50% of them through sometimes, or 40% you know, of them. So we're all working through the same process. And then I would also uh, say that it is very important to meet with the leadership of, of the PE committees and the uh, budget related committees. And you need to do that again. In that, in that summer month period, and then I think right before the session too, for those last minute things. And I think you've really got to get some buy-in from them and an understanding from, from Mark and Mark, if he's still there, um, if he's, you know, the chairman of the PD committee on the Senate side is running for something else, so we, we don't know who that player may be. But um, if he's still there, um, I think that would be important. The other thing I would tell you is the subcommittee chairman, especially the election subcommittee chairman, I think it would be very important to really get to them and have them understand your priority items too. Uh, you know, campaign finance and subcommittee I'm on, we, we get some of the issues that you all are concerned about, obviously. And I think the subcommittee chairman are very important uh, as well as the chairman. But if they at least know what your priorities are so that they can at least concentrate and make sure you have the best chance of working that legislation through uh, the process, I think that would uh, serve you very well. And I think they'd be willing to do that, but they've got to be approached and they've got to be reminded. Um, one of the things that happens once we get there is we've got so much stuff that's being thrown at us. I don't even remember what I, what I talk to people in the summer sometimes. And I have to be reminded, oh yeah, we, talk, we talked about that. That's an important issue for so um, I think that follow-up is, is uh, vitally important, too. Thank you, Sandy Molyneux, York County Secretary. 
Um, my comment is, is more of a request. Uh, I'm very concerned about um, persons, especially on the p and &E committee, when bills are introduced that would change election policy. And I'm going to give you a little scenario of what happened last year with the bill that was introduced to um, allow write-ins and dual primaries. Um, and we, we knew locally the cost, and I'm sure all the areas knew the cost and what that would be to each locale and to them. Um, at a meeting one night, one of the members of the delegate, House of Delegates was speaking, and he happened to mention casually that he was on the P&E committee. So I got really excited. I thought, I can give this man some information and let him know what it would cost the locales. Uh, I spoke to him afterwards. I even connected him to our registrar, who spoke with him for 20 or 30 minutes on the phone, explaining what this would do to each locale. He went back and voted for the bill the next morning. Um, so we kind of circled the wagons and had to draw pictures uh, of what the different boxes would do, how impossible it would be to just connect, continue with that bill with the uh, present uh, equipment. And uh, we still have some people that voted for it. But if you're on the P&E committee, like you're on the finance committee or anything, if a bill is introduced before for John Q. Public, and it's, oh, it's a nifty thing, okay, we get to write it in. Please check with registrars or local electoral boards and see what that would do to the local uh, economy. <laughs> Unfortunately, the bill died in committee. But um, please, that's, that's my only comment. Before you think, oh, that's a nifty bill, I'm gonna vote for it, find out what it will entail. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to interrupt this for just a second. I'm realizing that the distinguished members of the General Assembly are willing to stay here all afternoon. Uh, it is, however, one minute before 11 o'clock for those of you who are in desperate uh, straits to get out. And I would say, Sandy, in response to your comment, that I have buttonholed my own delegate in the um, House of the Senate, given a great deal of information. Um, I don't want to embarrass him by mentioning his name, but it was Roy Dickinson, a <laughs> wonderful fellow. Um, but after bombarding him with information, I met him coming out of the caucus, and Earl said, don't worry, that bill's going to go right on through. And I just had a heart attack. I said, Earl, I'm opposed to it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but as they, they say, they, they get a tremendous blizzard of paper dropped on them. And as we've been told today, you've got to lobby, 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 repeat, 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 ask for the commitment, and then come back and ask for it again, and then remind them that we are opposed to it. <laughs> are there any other questions for our delegates? Tony, I'd like to come, come to the mic, please. All right, I'll do that. This coming election may have involved all locales running around buying extra boxes. <laughs> I understand in Virginia to move things along forward is not a rapid thing that happens. Virginia is very slow, it always has been, it's a very good thing. Uh, vote centers came out of nowhere. I was pushing it with all my might within the organization here and found out it was very popular in this organization. But none of our elected officials ever heard of them. I'm not sure anybody in the General Assembly had ever heard of them before you got legislation this year to look at. It. And I am extremely proud of getting the legislation moved as forward as it did. I thought we did a good job. I didn't think we did anything more than it induced being dumped for me to work on it next year. It got through a couple of committees, which is good. And uh, in Prince William County, from which I'm from, the secretary, we have 77 precincts, and during primaries, we have four to five, 25 people show up in each of these precincts. So it's an extreme waste of money to open that many precincts. Now, that was a hard concept to get through to people. But I think uh, with our lobbying efforts this year, education ed efforts, which has started with you two gentlemen, uh, we're going to try to make sure it gets passed next year because we want to have it done sooner rather than later because it is, talking budget, it's a money saver. But I'd like to end this real quick from my comment is that you've thanked us for what we do. I want to thank you gentlemen and all you people who serve the General Assembly, all you people who serve as elected officials who get the raw end of a stick a lot of times. I admire what you do. I may not agree with what you do, but I admire what you do very much, and I'm sure most of us do too here. Thank you very much.
with the vote centers, one of the issues I think, and just um, you, you um, reminded me um, for the discussion on that, one, of, one thing our members confuse the vote centers with is the party canvas process, which you all know is also called the firehouse primary um, method, which basically is similar to vote centers except rather than have the election officials run the actual primary as we, as we do now, you would have you know, party uh, individuals do that. And, I think so. That's one thing we just need to be aware of for next year is that they don't. They need to understand that it, all it is is a primary system with um, limited polling places to save money. They got it confused with the firehouse primary method, and that's why um, they said well, we already have that in place. The party can do it. The difference is the party runs that. This is still the general uh, election officials that are running the, the process, so that the general public can participate, not just the party. And then the other thing about um, uh, the lady's uh, question before, um, Robin's right. We, we sometimes get easily confused about when you're supporting something or when you're opposing something. And it's, again, you, you just need to keep reminding us, no, we're not in favor of this, we're opposed to this. And just keep reminding us, people get confused. And um, somebody will say something in committee that says, oh, um, They'll even represent groups and say, oh, they don't have any opposition to this. And if you all aren't there, that doesn't necessarily mean you're in favor of it. Maybe the legislator has not heard that you're opposed to it. So always tell also the patron of the legislation that you're opposing, even if you understand you're on the opposite side, to make sure they understand you're not in favor of it so they can't represent the fact that you haven't taken a position or you're not opposed or the like. Because legislators will use that. Um, try to use that to their advantage sometimes. And they're not being dishonest if you haven't talked to them because they just, they don't know. They haven't heard that there's any opposition. Uh, so make sure that you're clear from the standpoint when you impose things as well. You can do something as simple as emailing your legislator saying, reminder, of no, N-O, <laughs> H-B, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the letter is even better. It's written the old-fashioned way. Um, and we'd be happy to provide you with the, the Viva pen to do it and you know, to make the official letter. Um, just before we close, I want to say um, the uh, president has a um, small thank you gift for our speakers. But I wanted to say on behalf of Viva, uh, when I introduced these two speakers, uh, I need to apologize. I did not identify them as to which political party they belonged to, nor the fact that one of them is a Lutheran and one of them is a Presbyterian. <laughs> nor one of them lives down the valley and one lives up the valley, because these things are not important to facilitating free, fair, open, and transparent elections. And in my opinion, if we could have members of the General Assembly act with comity and amity as these two representatives have today in bringing common sense issues, Virginia would vault forward. And we want to thank you both very much for coming to the The other way, not so much. Um, we also thank the entire State Board of Elections, Charlie Judd, Kimberly Bowers, and Don Palmer for spending the weekend with us as well. And I now declare us adjourned, and we'll see you soon. Bye.